is a battle between the government and the gangs. Hey, how are you? Okay, you know. Every day this year, more than five people have been killed. It's bonkers. Richie! I've never been to Rio before. It's famous through time because of this sort of almost has this glamorous feel about it. Looks absolutely amazing. Rio's a really cool place, you know, it's uh, everything that you imagine it's going to be. It's beautiful. You have that iconic curved beach. The people are very warm, very friendly. There's just a real relaxed, very chilled out kind of kind of vibe, especially along and on the beaches. All you need to do is sort of look up and around you and you see some of the more famous landmarks that Rio's known for. It's football, it's people on the beaches, and then partying in the evening. It's a sort of amazing atmosphere there and really sensational to look at, really quite amazingly beautiful. And at the same time, right bang up against all these beautiful apartments and hotels, literally next door are these huge favelas, which are extreme poverty, extremely violent, and dangerous places if you wander into them. Even as you're driving in from the airport, you're passing favelas. You cannot miss the poverty as soon as you arrive. It is absolutely everywhere. So you have this huge glamour, but also it's surrounded by people who are living in abject poverty. And huge numbers of them. Right now, there are over a 1,000 favelas in Rio de Janeiro. From a distance, the favelas look quite beautiful. They're climbing up the hillside, and visually, they're really quite something to look at. When you approach them, though, it becomes very clear that you're entering a very, very different world indeed. There's barricades down every street. Yeah. And why are they there, Martin? So the police cars can get inside the, the favela. It's not like you can just arrive at a favela and go inside. You can't just openly film in, uh, this part of the favela, but you've got a contact. They are closed areas, really. Nobody from the outside is welcome unless you have somebody with you who's from there. From there, from down there, nobody can be a little more careful. So you can't just wander in uh, to a favela. What's happening, Rich? What are you doing? We can't have the camera shot on the camera. It's OK to go with the camera, but he will let us know if we need to stop filming. OK. We had an excellent guide with us, a young man who runs a project for kids in the favela, and he showed us around. Because we're with a guide, it's fine. Everyone knows him. If we hadn't cleared it, we wouldn't have got two steps in. He showed us little spots where you could see graffiti on the walls and art, and so you got a sense of identity within that favela. You're walking through very narrow alleyways, and life is going on all around you as you're doing this. Life is just bustling. It's loud, it's noisy. But there is a very dark undertone to the informal organization of the favela. It's a completely unique environment, another dimension almost. Right at the bottom of the road are some of the most expensive apartment blocks in Rio, and yet across the highway, the start of the most violent favela, they deal an awful lot of cocaine out of that favela, and that cocaine is bought by the people living in the rich apartments across the road. Hey, hey, stay here. The fighting between the gangs and the police there is almost continuous. These are massive firefights. A shooting incident in Rio is full-on warfare for sometimes days at a time. 
You wouldn't imagine that in a city like Rio de Janeiro that you would see scenes which are basically like a frontline war zone. Equivalent to anything I've ever been involved in, equivalent to anything I've ever witnessed in any of the hostile environments we've worked on around the world. It is much nearer to being in a war zone than it is to being in a, what you'd expect, a gangland fight with the police. Once you were in those neighbourhoods, you could very well have been in the alleyways of Mosul or of Raqqa. I mean, we're not talking a little skirmish. We are talking seven or eight hours of proper fighting with heavy weapons. Move out! And this is happening around neighbourhoods where people are getting on with their daily life. But the police claim they're using the force to defend themselves. The problem being, of course, is that those bullets are going somewhere. Every day this year, more than five people have been killed in Rio State by the police. Most of those killings happen here in the Flavelas. That's five or six people per day killed by the police. Innocent people are getting caught up in the crossfire. You get the impression that within those favelas, life is cheap. And it's happening a few hundred metres from a beach where rich people are enjoying their holiday. To highlight that, we saw footage of a police helicopter circling a favela, and this is where, you know, families live in very, very dense proximity to each other. And this police helicopter was pouring automatic fire down onto the favela. It's bonkers. <laughs> Rio is huge, and as you might expect, traffic can be absolutely terrible. Everyone uses driving apps, but there's a difference here. They use one that tells you where there's fighting taking place, shootings between the police and the gangs. In Portuguese, it's OTT, but it's, it translates as where's the shooting. The sat-nav here tells you where not to go, so you don't get caught up in a nasty incident. Not how to get somewhere quickly, but how to get there alive. I mean, it's, that's difficult to get your head around. But it's just a red, red, you know, it, it had various colours showing, you know, various parts that were active. And there will be at least one, two, maybe half a dozen, maybe a dozen shootings at that point in time. He was a little bit surprised that we hadn't even heard of it before, because surely you don't drive around a city without having things to tell you where the latest shooting is taking place. It is a battle between the government and the gangs with the police as a sort of proxy in the middle to carry out the government's demand. We've been trying to make contact with the drug factions. No, the favel. Can we go in? No. We've done gangs in all sorts of different countries. Take the lights off. It's crazy how dangerous it is. You need to find somebody who has links to them, and we did find a guy. And he had to go into a period of negotiation with the gang that he knew well. You have to do a lot of convincing that it is in their interest to talk to you, to tell you about why it is that they're doing what they're doing. It was about trust. They had to see us. They had to actually have a sense of who we were. It was only a meet and greet. You can watch what we do, but you can't film it. Absolutely no cameras. Don't even think about it. If we had done anything to take pictures where they said we couldn't, it was made absolutely clear they would just kill us on the spot. They kill outsiders on a regular basis who have come into the favela who shouldn't have. They only wanted to meet at night because it's safest for them. And so we, we pulled up into this first area and um, it was actually a night of, a, of one of their birthday parties. They were absolutely high on drugs and alcohol and it was pretty scary because everyone's got a machine gun. This is serious. These guys aren't messing around. The next day, there was a police raid. One member of the gang uh, was killed. We only found this out while going to meet them for a second time. And I became very concerned at that moment. I'm feeling you should do the diplomacy. I don't know yet. We were all a little concerned that these guys might put two and two together and come up with five and think that we might have had something to do with it. What happens if they say they got arrived and then we had a raid? Is it us? We sat down and we had a long t chat and talk about it at a, at a sort of cafe. We wanted to make sure that they weren't in any way blaming us for, for the situation. Are we going to chill out, maybe even have a beer with them, sit down, just talk and then... Yeah, just 
If we didn't go back in, then they really would start thinking. Let's go and get a, get a feel for it. I have to say, I, I, I still have my doubts. I, I wasn't 100% sure on that. Whole different atmosphere when we got back the second time. We were actually looking at a proper business, proper gang. We spent hours with them. We could not film a frame. Honestly, I could have shot a movie there. It was incredible. Everywhere you looked, the whole time I was standing there having my diplomatic beer with these guys and I was just thinking, please let me shoot this, please let me shoot. It was just incredible. But the consequences of doing something like that could end up in your death. It was, it was crazy. One car pulled up. And they opened the back door and on, stacked on the back of it was cocaine, which took up basically the whole back seat and was about this high, piles of it. I've never seen anything like it. After a couple of days of building a bit of relationship, uh, the drug gang agreed to speak to us on camera. This is the first time we've been allowed sort of freely outside in the favela. There's been a police raid here only the last few days, and there's another one going on right now. So it's, uh, it's a pretty dangerous area. Okay, guys, I'm going to film some of this now. You're always nervous. You're nervous of the police. Could come in and there's a huge firefight. You're nervous of them. They might suddenly change on you. There's nowhere to run. I mean, you have no idea where you are. I mean, you couldn't get out. You just couldn't get out. We were told to go and wait down an alleyway. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. They're coming this way. They're all masked up and they're tooled up. I mean, really tooled up. Hey, how are you? They were in serious business mode when they came to meet us to talk on camera. There was no messing around. They look menacing. And it's all the more menacing because, you know, these guys are the real deal. I mean, getting into gunfights with the police, killing people, is something they do on a daily basis. How many are in the group? 50 100 hombres. It's really very serious business, right? It's big business. Sí, sí. They need to make money. What is your main business within the favela? Uh, cocaína. They join a gang because it's a legitimate business. You've got a guy who's balaclavered up, carrying a machine gun, who clearly would kill with impunity, and yet he's making a point that actually it's just business. It just happens to be a business that we find in, in, in normal society unacceptable, where in their society it's completely acceptable. These guys were properly tooled up, not just some old AK-47, really sophisticated machine guns. The quality of their weaponry, I mean, it was up there. It would have been some of the world's special forces would have been happy to have some of this kit. There's no denying that these guys were a step up from your, your average gangster. They were much nearer to being a militia than it was to being with a crime gang, or whatever we perceive a crime gang to be. They saw it almost as if they were soldiers. If the police come in and try and affect their business or try and disrupt their way of life within the favela, they believe they have every right to defend themselves. They're the business, they're the main guys, and, and, and that came across in spades. We realised, actually, you know, that the money man's the guy. The accountant who runs the books for the drug deals. So we get into the back of the car, not quite sure what to expect. I guess. And then have the most frank, candid conversation with this guy. Is your job made worse by the police? See. Perfectly open about how he conducts business, the amount of money they bring in, the scale of the operation. He wasn't bragging about anything. He was just telling us what he does for a living and how it works. And so you're in this car in the favela. We can hear firing taking place because there's a raid just taking place up the road. But they're totally relaxed. <laughs> and then they pulled out this massive wad of money. And that was like two days' takings. He was meticulous. The notes were wrapped in elastic bands. They had very detailed notes on collection date, collection times, how much money. He was a proper accountant. You expect them all to be sort of bloodthirsty killers, but actually they're not. It's just actually a business. And as he said, all of society is involved. They were perfectly happy to talk. We were in their house, yeah, and, they, and they were, they're the governors. We wanted to visit a school that was caught in the crossfire between two rival drug gangs and also with police operations. 
it's right in the boundary between two crime gangs. And it's also on the main route that the, the police take to come and uh, attack the gangs. This is our first day that the school has been open for the last three days because of uh, fighting here. We can't film anywhere but in this little alleyway. At the end of that, we've already passed gunmen. There's more that way and there are more that way. This school is an oasis in the middle of a war zone. We were in there and we were interviewing the, the headmistress, who's an absolute firecracker. Just to show you a little bit of the favela. But... She just gets out her phone. That's just the audio from, from here. Yeah, from here. Let's do it. From that to window here. So she starts playing me um, the, the sound that they had recorded on her phone. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> incredible. That is incredible. This was all day. This is only two minutes and 15 that we record. But to go over all day. The teachers all took, also took pictures of the kids lying on the ground, scared, while the firing was going on just outside the window. With their hands over their ears, who just can't cope with that level of violence. And they're just little kids. So they have to go up there. We can, can we yeah, yeah, you'll go with her. We knew that this wasn't a one-off. When we saw on the roof of the school... There's the sign on the top, which is basically the school, don't shoot. And that's for the police helicopters when they're doing the operations. I mean, incredible. You can't imagine what that must be like for a five, six, seven, eight, nine, 14, 50. It would be terrifying for me, never mind, a child who is in school. Amongst all of this adventure that we were having, there is also the tragedy. That was very clear to us when we met Andrea, a lovely woman who had tragically lost her husband. He was actually a Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor who helped local kids get off the street and give them some structure in their lives. He was at this favela uh, as a volunteer to help kids find a different path outside of violence. She had arranged to do the interview with us at the club where her husband had taught jiu-jitsu to the kids. And it was the first time she'd been back to the gym since her husband had been killed. She walked in and the reaction from the kids and the other instructors was really, really heart-rending, it was, it was special. The kids bowed and then greeted her. It was very, very emotional for her. My son does exactly the same sport. And I could see my boy in, in the same environment. And then you suddenly realize where you are and how dangerous it all is. I felt really choked up at the time. They volunteer to work in the favelas. A raid took place. He was sort of hiding from the bullets and the police came over and shot him. And he was killed outright. He was on his way to class. We often don't realize that in Brazil there's a terrible race issue and that her husband was killed because he fit the criteria of somebody who would possibly be a gang member. You are shaking? She wasn't full of hate or anything like that. She was still a kind, compassionate woman. And then at the end of the interview, she pulls up her shirt and shows where she's been shot. Almost casually, you know, oh yeah, I've, I've been shot as well. Hardline policies are really mostly supported by people who are not affected by them. Behind the current push against the favela gangs is Brazil's newly elected president. The government's saying that they're going to eradicate crime in the favelas. Jair Bolsonaro, the president, he's just hardcore, right wing. The problem is, is that a huge sections of the country don't like this. We had only been in Brazil a day or two, and there was a huge demonstration on the streets. When we first turned up, I would say, well, this is just like a party. We felt we were sort of more part of just a, 
a carnival. It's Brazil, so, I mean, everything's an excuse for a party, isn't it? There was still, you know, great music. There was still a lot of food going around the place. There was still a lot of dancing. It's the first time in a while that we face this kind of government. People will keep going more and more in the streets. These people are out because they don't like Bolsonaro. They want to send a clear message to him. They don't like his policies. And also, most of these people here believe that he's utterly corrupt. Marcia, our Brazilian producer, said, guys, you're being lured into a false sense of security. It will turn nasty. An extreme far-left element where they're definitely intending to provoke a reaction from the police. Richie's trying to get the best pictures and trying to get right amongst it, and then we're trying to keep up with him, and there's always an element of chaos. I see these guys, and I think, oh, I'll go and get a shot of them. They start to put hands in front of the cameras and then try and get a little bit brave. So I backed off because I did not want to be the cause of a situation happening. Suddenly, boom. No, 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 go back, go back, go back. The more anarchist side of the protest group launched fireworks directly at the police. It's not just your average firework. It's a, it's a sort of an incendiary device. The police have decided to move forward. It was perhaps inevitable that this was going to happen as blast bombs going off left, right, centre. We're just trying to figure out the safest way out. Teamwork's really important in a situation like this because I'm obviously concentrated on the pictures and it's very easy to get tunnel vision and not see what's happening around you. Did they try to hit you? They try to you. Everybody's having to watch everybody's back because a threat can come from anywhere. And it's people like Dominique and Marcia who actually keep us safe in those situations. It's already a war zone. It's difficult to see how it could get any worse. It's very easy to see these gangs as extreme criminals, which is something that they are, there's no denying that. These are people who are the marginalised of society. There may be a policy to try and eradicate the gangs, but it's very difficult to see how that can be done when they are absolutely part of society and poverty is everywhere. So they are there and probably there to stay.